So we're continuing in our series on loving one another that we've been doing for the last three months. And just as a, a reminder, it's, we're not, we don't love one another to earn God's favor. We don't love one another to be better Christians. We don't love one another to get nicer or something like that. But because of the way we have been loved, we seek to grow and to become more and more like our Father. Like ultimately what we're trying to do is just be little mini-me's, mini-me's of our Father. And because He is loving, we look to grow. And we're charismatics, okay? So if you didn't know that when you, when you arrived in here, just to, what that generally means is we believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But sometimes as charismatics, our weakness is we just go to what I feel. And oh, if I don't feel it, I don't do it. The trouble is that most of the time, I don't feel like being a Christian. I don't feel like doing anything that the Bible says. I certainly don't feel like forgiving when somebody's done something wrong. I certainly don't feel like being generous. I certainly don't feel like doing anything. So if you're going to wait until you feel like it, well, that will probably happen in heaven. And so you're going to miss out on what God wants to do in it, do, do in you. And so D Dallas Willard, who is kind of recognized as the father of modern day sort of spiritual disciplines, and really what he did is took the spiritual disciplines that have been used for centuries, for millennia through the church, and kind of put them into a modern context and described, sort of re reawakened how we do them. And some people sort of, particularly from a, charisma a charismatic leaning like us, kind of recoil and go, oh, that's all effort, and that's us all trying to do it in our own strength. And he described very well, he, he described this triangle, and in the center of the triangle is us increasingly becoming like Christ. And on the top of the triangle, the point of one of the one of the points of the triangle is the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So without the power of the Holy Spirit, we don't change. We don't grow. We don't transform. So absolutely this has got to be about the Holy Spirit working in us and through us. And if you've put your trust in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. It's impossible to be a Christian and not have the Holy Spirit. Whether you've ever tangibly experienced it or not, you have the Holy Spirit inside you. But, but, there are experiences where we get filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's not a one-off thing either. So some people say, oh, well, you know, it's, it happened to me once back in 1972, and that's me done for the rest of my life. And I wasn't born in 1972 before any of you started making nasty comments. Um, <laughs> still wrong. Ha <laughs> ha. And um, I was not born in 73. Um, but it's, like, it's not a one-off occurrence where it's like, I got my little top up from the Holy Spirit, and that's me done for the rest. Paul says, ongoingly, again and again and again be filled with the Holy Spirit. Where it says be filled with the Holy Spirit, it's the present continuous tense that it happens over and over and over and over again. Because I don't know the theology of explaining this. Like I don't, this, somebody's probably going to tell me that this is wrong. But basically, we get filled up and then we leak. And so if you got filled up once a long, 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 long time ago, yeah, yeah, you're running an empty. Because basically, as humans, we're, we, we, hold, we hold the Holy Spirit a bit well, as well as a colander holds water. It's just because of life and because of circumstances. And so we keep on being filled up, being filled up. So the Holy Spirit is absolutely part of it. But the another point of this triangle is spiritual disciplines. And the spiritual disciplines don't. And by that, I mean things like praying reading our Bibles, and some of the things that charismatic hate, charismatics hates, like solitude and silence. Whoa. Like, I spoke to a lady, uh, one of the other ministers in town. She's just been on a month-long silent retreat. Like, can you imagine not speaking for a month? Or maybe some of you can imagine. I can't imagine it. It's like, ooh, I start to, like, get a little bit angsty just even thinking about it. And yet, Jesus withdrew to lonely places 
to speak with his Father. And as we've seen when we when we fasted, as we've seen other when we block out the other noises. We block out the bombardment of stimulation that our society throws on top of us. Mysteriously, or not so mysteriously, it becomes easier to hear what Jesus is saying. If your ears are not blocked with the other noises, funnily enough, it gets easier to hear what he's saying. And so there's a whole heap of practices that have been common throughout the church for millennia. And as we begin to grow in these... The Holy Spirit fills those places. It's like we're creating space in our lives for the Holy Spirit to, to fill. So don't think that if I fast more or if I practice silence or any one of those, th those things are going to make me closer to Jesus in themselves. Because there's plenty of people from other religions fast as well. And there's plenty of people from other religions fast. So those things in themselves don't make you any closer to Jesus. But when you do them for the purpose of allowing the Holy Spirit space to work in you and through you, then you begin to see things change. And the third point of the triangle, I think all humans hate, but especially as charismatics, we really don't like them. And it's just life's hardships. Whoa. Why does that one have to be there? And it's like... A combination of the Holy Spirit working in me and through me, me intentionally creating space for God to work in my life, and just the daily grind of life. Those three things together, as I continue to pursue Jesus in him, that's where I become more like Jesus. That's where the mind of Christ that it says I've been given begins to, begins to come out of me more and more. We get given, the moment of salvation, we get given a status of perfect, flawless righteousness. I have become the righteousness of Christ. You have become the righteousness of Christ. You don't have to hang around me, with me for that long to realize it's not visible all the time. And maybe you're similar, maybe. And so we get given this status of who we are, and then we spend the rest of our Christian life increasingly becoming who he says we already are. It's strange in our logic, but his logic is better. And so he gives us everything, and then increasingly we become. But it doesn't just happen by, like, I woke up one morning and I became the righteousness of Jesus. It's like, oh, how did that happen? No, no, I intentionally create space for God to work in my life. And sometimes I do things that I don't feel like doing, like forgiving people and praying or, you know, being generous or whatever. And as I do them, the Holy Spirit, meet, it's like the Holy Spirit takes my little bit and applies his power to it. And the power of God and the, uh, is formed in me and I become more like Jesus. And so that's why we're talking about these things that we do, how we love one another. Because, as we've said as well, we were part of one family that wasn't God's family. And then the moment we become Christians, we get adopted into another family, God's family. And the people around us all become our brothers and sisters. And as you look around the room, your brothers and sisters, they're not all the same as you. And it's I was going to say it's really easy. No, actually, anybody who's in any family knows that's not really easy either. Um, so just looking the same, sounding the same, being from the same place and having the same traditions doesn't necessarily make it easier. But when we're all different, and in a lot of ways, we've got no obvious reason to be in this room apart from Jesus. And so it takes intentionality to go, I'm going to learn to love these people on days when I feel like it and days when I don't feel like it. Because as I do that, I become more like my Father in heaven. I become a mini-me of God himself. And so, actually, Steve reminded me this week, at the start of the, start of the, the year, I said to you, is there one thing out of this series that the Holy Spirit has spoken to you about that you feel like he's really trying to work on you. And if there, was one, if there wasn't one thing, Holy Spirit, please, just one thing out of three months, that would be awesome for each one of us. But if there, was, if there is one thing or more, what are you doing with that? Because again, just going, oh, that really impacted me. Right, let's get on with life. Nothing's going to change. But Holy Spirit... 
that really impacted me. I feel like you're speaking to me out of this. Now, how do I continue to grow? How on a daily basis do I grow in that? What steps do I need to take so that there's space created for your power operating through my life to bring change so that I'm transformed to look like Jesus? We don't have capacity to change in 15 different ways in a couple of months. Well, maybe you do. I don't. If there's one or two things that I'm working on at any, or the Holy Spirit's working on in me at any time, that's kind of my capacity to change. The rest of it just becomes overload. And so just out of this whole thing, just hold on to those one or two things that the Holy Spirit's really arrested you, really hit your heart, and you think, oof, that needs to change. And allow him to work. So today, we're going to speak, or I'm going to speak about a Greek word that shows up five times in the New Testament. And apologies to any Greek speakers, Greek people, or Greek students. I may butcher the, butcher the pronunciation of philozenos or philozenia. Anybody know what philozenos or philozenia mean? There you go. Exactly right. Love of strangers. <laughs> Philo is love. Xenos is strangers. That's where we get the word xenophobia from. So xenophobia is fear of strangers. If we, The word in English is xenophilia, is love of strangers. It's the opposite of xenophobia. How is it translated in the New Testament? Nope. Translated into one word in the New Testament. Hospitality. So who knew that hospitality is love of strangers, biblically? Maybe, he, yes, he probably did. Uh, it's a good point. But I'm saying he, who here in the room knew? Probably none of us. Because we think of hospitality as being generous and kind to people that we know, being generous and kind to our friends, to our family. But actually, that's not what biblical hospitality is. That's just common decency. So just to look at this word that gets translated, like I said, five times, so Romans 12, 10 to 13, be devoted to one another in love, Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual server, fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Full stop. Practice hospitality. Practice love of strangers. And it says practice. So it's not be good at it from the moment, but actually like anything else, in other words, learn how to do it and do it repeatedly until you're good at it. Practice love of strangers. Not all one line, verse 13. Share with the Lord's people in need and, be, and do hospitality. No, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Full stop. Next sentence. Practice love of strangers. 1 Timothy 3, verse 2. He's talking about the qualifications for an elder, but I don't think that it needs to be limited to just that. Now, the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, a lover of strangers, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Titus 1 verse 7 to 8, again talking about overseers, manages God's household. He must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violence, not pursuing dishonest gain, but rather he must be hospitable. In, in other words, he must demonstrate love to strangers. One who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, upright, holy, and disciplined. 1 Peter 4 verse 9, above all, Love one another deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality, the love of strangers, to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you receive to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And Hebrews 13, 2. Keep on loving one another as br brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. 
I'd love to have been like a fly on the wall when that happened. Like somebody invited an angel into their home and thought, oh, we had a great dinner with that guy. And the angel was going, hee, hee, hee. They didn't even realize. Or maybe angels don't think like that. Maybe that's just my mind. <laughs> so it's not about looking after your friends or your family. Jesus said in Luke 6, if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those who, and expect a repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of your Father in heaven, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. So if you want to be like your Father in heaven... If you want to increasingly grow to be like God, and we exist to reveal who He is and what He's like, we exist. Like if this was just about getting to heaven, if this was just about getting my golden ticket stamped so I can go to heaven, well then, the moment I put in trust in Jesus, get me out of here. Like, I don't know if you've noticed, but this world's not amazing. It's fairly broken. Now, we're still here so that everybody who doesn't know Jesus yet gets to see what he's like. And so I've got to become increasingly like him so that it's not that I talk about him all the time, although we should talk about him, but they need to see from looking at me and from you what he's looked like. And so if our Father in heaven is good to those who are not good to him, if he gives to those who give him nothing back, if he only, like if we only invite those into our homes who we know are probably likely to, back, to invite us back, what Jesus is saying, you're no different from the pagans. They do that too. Ouch. Like, you start to drill down to what Jesus is actually saying. It starts to get quite uncomfortable. Paul takes his train of thought even further in 1 Timothy 5, 4 to 8. And he's talking about how widows should be taken care of. He says, if a widow has children or grandchildren, they should first learn to, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repay their parents and grandparents for this is pleasing to God. Verse 7, Give the people these instructions so that may, no one may be open to blame. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So looking after your own family, looking after the people that, like you, you know, are close to you, that's Christianity 101, not even Christianity 101. He says, you decide that, nah, not doing that. He says, you're worse than an unbeliever. So... When I'm thinking, I'm so hospitable, I've had this friend in my house, and I've had this family member in my house, and I'm so generous to that person I like, and they're going to invite me back because I know they're always like that, and that was amazing, and I did, and the Holy Spirit's going, what's that? It's no different to a pagan. Someone who's never encountered Jesus, someone who never experienced the love of God, somebody who has none of the Holy Spirit inside them can do exactly that thing that you're feeling proud about. Oof. Now, think about the context that this is written into. So, one, the first century church, the world was, I was going to say the world was smaller. I don't mean literally. The world has not expanded, as far as I know. Um, but the world that they experienced was an awful lot smaller. Jerusalem was the biggest city between Alexandra and Egypt and Syria in, uh, Damascus in Syria. And they reckon the population of Jerusalem in the time of Jesus was about 70,000 people. Just for context, the borough of Kingston, which I think is the second smallest borough in London, has a population of 180,000. Kingston Uni has 21,000 students and 2,000 staff. So basically, Jerusalem, which is the biggest city between Alexandria in Egypt and Damascus in Syria at that time, was about two and a half times the size of Kingston Uni. That's what a big city looked like back then. And so, and most people didn't live in cities. It's only in the last 20, 25 years that over 50% of the world's population now live in cities. So most people lived in small towns and villages, rurally, and most of the people that were there, in, that they knew, were in the same clan as them, like distantly related the idea of living in a place where there's people from 
basically every tribe and every nation of the world. Like you look around the room here. This is incomprehensible to a first century uh, Palestine person because well, I think we have to admit xenophobia was a massive issue in those, in those empires. It's like you came from outside, half the time they just killed you because it's like, oh, we don't, we don't like that type. And so they, it's just very, very different. So love of strangers for us is actually possible to practice just in here because we have people from different tribes, different nations, different tongues. All of us gather together in one place. When Paul talks about looking after your own family, to him, he's not thinking of like me and my spouse and my 2.4 children and my white picket fence or whatever image that brings to you of our society. He's talking about their clan. It's like the, the, the extended family. We don't look at that as much. But that, to him, is basic. It's beyond that that we start to demonstrate hospitality. It's beyond that that we start to demonstrate what it means to love those, to show hospitality to those who are different, who are strangers to us. And I'm not trying to soften the command by saying, well, actually just look around the room. I think start here and move out. In other words, don't, don't, sorry, don't move out. I'm not telling you to get out. But, you know, start here and start to stretch your love of strangers beyond that. But if we can't love those that we don't know, those from different cultures, different backgrounds, different languages in our own space, there's no hope of us doing it beyond that. And sometimes when I've spoken about this before, some people have said, but hold on, like, you don't understand my circumstances. Like, I can't entertain people in my home or I can't I, I like I can't I, do, I just don't have the money to serve somebody a meal well biblically the minimum requirements according to Jesus in Matthew 10 42 is if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to those little ones who is my disciples I tell you that a person that person will certainly not lose the reward so as far as I know a cup of cold water comes pretty much for free out of the tap you don't have to go to the well and draw it, and you don't have to carry that water jug home on your, on your head. I haven't seen anyone walking around Kingston doing that. Tap turns on. So if all that you can provide is a cup of cold water to somebody, then do it. And if you say, well, I actually can't have it, them in my house for whatever reason, well, there's coffee shops. Or there's, if you say, well, I can't do any of that, I can't afford it, well, what I could do maybe is help Karen on a Sunday because what they're doing is actually love of strangers. So you know what? I'm going to go and I'm going to offer to help Karen wash the dishes. That's going to be my contribution to that. There's so many ways that we can do this. If we say, actually, Father, I want to be like you and I want to demonstrate your love to people that I don't know. Therefore, I'm going to find a way to do it. Now, we don't live in a hot climate, so maybe the cup of cold water is not going to be that attractive. But maybe some hot water with a tea bag in it, you know, that's possible too. But I want to stretch and grow in this. I want to push myself beyond what's comfortable to reveal who God is. And yesterday when I was, when I was putting this together, I read the message translation of 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8 to 11, and it's absolutely beautiful. God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways so that you're ready for anything and everything, more than just ready to do what needs to be done. As one psalmist puts it, he throws caution to the wind, giving to the needy in reckless abandon. His right living, right giving ways never run out, never wear out. This most generous God who gives seed to the farmer that becomes bread for your meals is more than extravagant with you. He gives you something you can then give away, which grows into fully formed lives, robust in God, wealthy in every way, so that you can be generous in every way, producing with us great praise to God. How beautiful is that? Like, uh, there's, there's no 
Pentecostal in you, if you can't like raise a hallelujah or an amen to that, like that's, like I just read that yesterday, I almost just wanted to stand up on my couch and go, amen, like this is glorious, I'm going to read it again, God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways, so that you're ready for anything and everything, not just ready for what needs to be done, see it's not just functional, it's ready for anything. As one, one psalmist put it, he throws caution to the wind, giving to the needy in reckless abandon. Imagine that's how I was known. Imagine how that's you were known. People are like, yeah, that guy gives to the needy with reckless abandon. There's, there's something in this Christianity, there's something in this God that he believes in that means he gives to the needy with reckless abandon. His right living, right giving ways never run out, never wear out. This most generous God who gives seed to the farmer that becomes bread for your meals is more than extravagant with you. Generous, extravagant God. He gives you something that you can then give away. We're not supposed to be hoarders. We're blessed to be a blessing. We're supposed to be hose pipes, not bottlenecks. He gives you something you can give away which grows into fully formed lives. See, when you give something away, it becomes seed in somebody else's life that grows in them. Grows into fully formed lives, robust in God, wealthy in every way, so that you can be generous in every way, producing with us great praise to God. You see, when this happens, it produces great praise for God magnificent. A couple of stories. My granny knew this. She'd never let anyone come through her farmyard without giving them something. The amount of tradesmen and cattle dealers and dear knows what all that I go into the house and she'd be sitting there with them at the dinner table. There was even an old alcoholic guy who lived rough like in some of the fields and it was before my time, uh, but regularly she'd bring him in and give him a feed. To the extent that if somebody came to the house and she didn't have any food in the house, she was known to take down the gun, go out in the feed, field, shoot a rabbit, and prepare it and feed it. That's what she did. Now, again, I don't want to see anybody heading for Richmond Park deciding that this is how they're going to do it, because that's going to cause problems with it. But it's like she just made a plan. And I think, well, who comes, like, to talk to you? And you say, oh, just sit there for a while. I'd, I'd love to see the face of the visitor as she heads out the door with the rifle in her hand. And they're like going, what's going down here? And then a while later, she comes back with a rabbit in her hand. But it like, takes a bit of time to skin a rabbit and cook it and clean it and all that sort of stuff. It looks a little bit more biblical. Like, it says Abraham, like those angels show up or guests or whatever and he he says will you stay for a meal and then he runs and kills the fatted calf and he bakes some bread like that that's not a microwave meal that must have taken some time but you know so we work with what we've got our society is a little bit different but her conviction was anybody comes through my yard they get fed about uh, it must be 15 years ago now um, myself and another guy from the church, we went to Minsk in Belarus to preach in a church. And um, interesting place, Minsk. It's the only place outside of Russia where the KGB was still operating. So legally, you couldn't preach there. They only told me that after I arrived. Um, but on, I was supposed to preach with as the bishop of the denomination was, the Elam denomination was hosting us. I was supposed to preach in his church on the Sunday. Uh, preached there on the Friday night. And then Saturday night, he says to me, I've got to go to a funeral tomorrow. Uh, I haven't got a translator for you, so you're going to have to go and preach in some other church. I've got a translator for you. Now, I'm not sure why the translator couldn't come to his church, but anyway, that's beside the point. Um, so he says, oh, and they'll, they'll host you for lunch after, the, after you preach at the church. So I go to the other church, I preach there, and the translator takes me back to his mother and his grandmother's house. And it's like... It's a, you know, a communist era t concrete tower block about the 17th floor. It's exactly the same as the ones you're seeing on the news in Ukraine being blown up at the moment. The sort of uh, plumbing pipes are on the outside of the building and all this sort of crazy stuff that just looks weird to us. And so 
I go there and I get there and there's a table that's about the size of their tiny little lounge. And if it could creak, it would have creaked with the amount of food that is piled high on this table. And there's the old lady and the mother and the translator and me and the other guy from here. I'm like, who's going to eat all this? And they're like, you. You're our guest. So what's happened is the ladies got up, and these people are poor. They got nothing. The ladies got up on Saturday morning, and she felt the Holy Spirit say to her, you've got guests coming for lunch tomorrow. You need to start cooking. So she goes out and buys stuff and starts cooking a feast for people that she doesn't even know are coming. Sometime that evening, I can't remember, I don't know exactly the time, like sort of sometime between six and nine o'clock, the bishop that I was staying with phoned and said, can you host these guys for lunch? And that, so she's cooked all day for people that she doesn't even know is coming because she felt the Holy Spirit say it. And then we sit down, like I felt so bad because I couldn't, like after a while, it's like, one, you watch, they're watching you eat and they're like, because they're not, it's probably their week's food or more, but they just keep, like every time your plate empties, they keep putting more and I'm going like, I can't eat any more. I learned in their culture, you don't finish your plate because they keep putting more on towards. I'm like, it's, ingra- it's ingrained in me. Like I'm one of these kids, like you're not leaving the table until your plate's clear. And so you're like, oh, mom, I hate this. You're not leaving the table until your plate's clear. So I'm like, it's ingrained. I can't leave anything on my plate. And they just keep piling more stuff on. I'm like, oh, my goodness. This is like an eating competition. Love of strangers. She was following the, I tell you, I was so humbled and so blessed by what she did. Like I said, she had, they were poor people. They had nada. But she piled this table up for somebody she didn't even know. She didn't even know it was coming, and she didn't know who it was. And it's, it's, when you go to poorer countries, I often experience that. When you go to places that have less, we stayed in Bulgaria with Blago, who's ministered here, and there was a feed on the table every day. And I noticed his wife wasn't eating. I was like, why, why don't you come and eat with us? Oh, no, no. And eventually I worked out, no, they didn't have enough. So they're just giving us everything. And she wasn't eating. I'm going, oh, no, that's not right. But see, hospitality, the love of strangers had gripped her. She had got, this is how I demonstrate that I know who my father is. This is how I demonstrate what my father is like. That was her serving. It wasn't because she needed to. It was a response to the love that she'd received. Throwing caution to the wind giving to the needy with reckless abandon. His right living, right giving ways never run out, never wear out. This most generous God who gives seed to the farmer that becomes bread for your meals is more than extravagant with you. He gives you something you can then give away, which grows into fully formed lives, robust in God, wealthy in every way, so that you can be generous in every way, producing with us great praise to God. Holy Spirit, I pray, just show each one of us how we can grow, how we can stretch ourselves, to not just show love and generosity to those that we already know, to those who are close to us, to those who are family to us. But help us to, to see how we can show love and generosity to those beyond that, to those within this community that, that we don't yet know, those that we worship alongside every Sunday and we don't yet know their names. How we can help How we can be those who at least bring a cup of water. Maybe it's helping Karen. Maybe it's in the student pantry. Maybe it's taking somebody for a coffee. Maybe it's inviting somebody into our home. But Jesus, we want to intentionally think about how we can grow in this. Because it's not going to happen by accident. And one of the consequences of COVID is that all of us got out of the habit of having people in our homes because we weren't allowed. And it became a habit to not have people. 
And now we need to intentionally build back the habit the other way or else it will never happen. Holy Spirit, I pray that you help us. I pray that you stretch us, that you lead us, and that you guide us. In Jesus' name, amen.